Isabel, what vocal mic should I buy? This has got to be the most common question I'm asked by my students and podcast listeners, hands down. And I get it. Investing in a mic can feel like a big deal. There's so many options to choose from now and everyone you ask will give you a different recommendation. What's a girl to do? And that's why I've created a quick, easy 45 second quiz where you'll be matched with your perfect vocal mic. You'll tell me about your voice, your setup, your needs and your budget and I'll pair you with a vocal mic that's your perfect fit. No more trawling through the internet, scrolling through thousands of online reviews and losing all sense of time and space. And did I mention you'll even receive a free bonus video I recorded in my very own home studio showing you how to position your mic for your best sounding recordings yet. Just go to femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz to take the quiz and get your hands on all of this. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash quiz and get ready to meet your perfect vocal mic. Now, we can find lots of very complicated and intelligent ways subconsciously to trick ourselves into not getting started with our music because we're scared. And we'll come up with all these reasons that we think are very worthy and very valid. And there's often a kernel of truth in them. But is this argument that it's too trivial to be focusing on music right now considering everything that's going on in the world is this just an elaborate way for you to not have to take that risk and make those bold moves and start taking yourself seriously as a woman in music hello and welcome to girls twiddling knobs my name's isabel and over the last decade my self-produced and self-released music has amassed over 25 million spotify streams I also have a PhD in sonic arts, but I wasn't always this confident with music tech. In fact, I still hear those self-doubt gremlins in my head from time to time. I started this podcast to help more female identifying musicians start recording and producing their music and learn from other women making music with technology. If that's your cup of tea, then you're in the right place, my friend. Let's dive in. Now, 2020 has been quite the year, to say the least, and there's no denying the challenges that many of us have faced between the global pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement and the devastating impacts of climate change. It could feel like making music is just too self-indulgent and trivial in comparison. But in today's episode, we're getting a reality check, my friend. Because I'm going to show you why right now the world needs your music more than ever. Now, before we get started, I want to do a quick listener shout out. Natalie M26 says about the podcast, Never has a podcast or just an artist slash industry figure in general made me feel so seen, heard and encouraged. As a woman who's been instinctively twiddling knobs since I was 14, but always felt like a fraud, so just threw money at producers, never felt good enough and kept quitting on myself, Isabel's encouragement has genuinely changed my entire perspective and I will never quit music again. Well, Natalie, thank you so much. It's so incredible to read that review on the Apple podcast app and to know that Girls Twiddling Knobs is really helping you to believe in yourself and take your music seriously. Um, So it's just so incredible to be able to read that out on the podcast. Um, If you would like to have a shout out yourself, then all you have to do is rate and review the podcast. And that will also help us to get in front of even more women and girls. And before we begin this episode, I also want to just highlight the awesome quiz that I have made, especially for any female identifying musicians. It's called Discover Your Female Producer Spirit Guide. Now, I've selected four incredible female producers of different genres and different backgrounds. And when you take the quiz, you'll find out which one can guide you into some unexplored territory, exciting new techniques and priceless tools that are going to transform your own recording and production. So head to femalediymusician.com forward slash zero six. That's femalediymusician.com forward slash zero six to take the quiz and find out who your female producer spirit guide is. Okay, so let's begin by just stating the obvious today, which is 
that 2020 has been really, really, really hard. Don't get me wrong, I think there's been some incredible gains that people have made um, in unexpected places, but for a lot of us, it's been really challenging navigating social distancing, the uncertainty in general of the pandemic, not having control or a lot of stability in our income, and also having to spend lots of time away from loved ones and friends. And for some of us, it's been downright traumatic. There may be people listening to this podcast who have lost loved ones and have seriously, seriously experienced poverty and hardship and um, incredible changes that have been very, very, very difficult. So um, I think that it's really important just to flag that right at the beginning of today, that this goes almost without saying. But then even when we look in the arts, the impact has been devastating as well. We've seen theatre companies, ballet companies, opera houses, um, you know, incredible indie gig venues all pleading for support because of the devastating impact of having to close their doors, not be able to support the the vast number of freelancers who rely on them. Um, And it's been very, very, very difficult for the arts. And obviously, we look around and we can see so many important ways that we could contribute to change in the world. It's not just about COVID. It could be about the political unrest. The Black Lives Matter movement has been enormous and much, much overdue. But there's also the impact of climate change around the world. Um, Particularly if you're listening in Australia, you've had quite the year in terms of devastating impacts to do with fires and days and months and weeks of smoke that is unbearable to live with. So... There are so many different issues that we could get behind and that we could lend our gifts and our energy and our time to. And if you feel like that, then I absolutely commend you because not everyone has that empathy and motivation to do good in the world. And if you're if you're feeling that pull to to contribute, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So this this episode is not about telling you to not feel those things. But if this is getting in the way of you investing time and resources in your music then that could be an issue. And so this episode, we're really going to start to untangle why that might be. Um, It might be that you've been telling yourself it's far too trivial or self-indulgent to be spending time writing music, which you have no idea the impact it might have, if it could reach anybody's ears, if anyone would even care. So why should you spend time doing that rather than something that's much more important and useful? And um, and obviously, right at the beginning, I want to say it doesn't have to be an either or situation. It really doesn't. Um, so you could do both. But I also understand that people have limited time and that people may be really questioning now the importance of making music. But um, this episode is here to, to help you see just how important it is. Um, but I want to first start by exploring some questions around this. Why might you be feeling these feelings? Why might you be telling yourself these things? And I want to look at it from a, you know, partly a feminist perspective, it being girls twiddling knobs. So the question I want to firstly ask is, do women undervalue their creative expression more than men? It, are women feeling this more than their male counterparts? Now, I think it's going to be really hard for me to definitively answer that. But what I definitely can do is start exploring some of this question in general terms. So there's an article published in the journal Psychology Science by Devon Proudfoot, Aaron C.K. and Christy Z. Koval. And this shares how studies show that men are perceived as more creative than women. And inside the article, they state that this boost in men's perceived creativity is mediated by attributions of agency, not competence, and predicts perceptions of reward deservingness. So what does that mean? So basically, therefore, not only is creativity often judged depending on how strongly a person believes they have the ability to make choices and take action, according to this research, but this also then impacts upon how much they believe they deserve to benefit from these actions too. So... The the study has found that basically men often believe that with their creativity, they can do the things that they imagine they want to do. They actually have agency with it. They can make choices. They can make decisions. They can take action with their creativity. But also that if they use their creativity, they deserve to have the rewards that come with that, like um, accolades or a pay rise or success, you know, outward success. Um, 
So men are more likely to feel those things than women. Women are more likely to feel that even if they do identify as being creative, they won't actually be able to take action on it as easily. And if they do, they're not as deserving of the rewards that may come with it. So that could be a reason why women in general find it harder to identify with their creativity and value their creativity and therefore whether or not they should be investing their time and their resources in it. So why would that be? What's feeding into this? Well, in another article published in the journal Learning and Individual Differences, authors Kurowski, Gralowski and Skumski really sorry about my pronunciations there, describe how male and female students differ in how they perceive their own creativity. They say in the article, and I quote, as male students tend to perceive creativity as a more fixed and less malleable characteristic than female students do, their sensitivity to external influences on their creative self-efficacy may be generally lower. So basically unpacking that, if this is the case... As female musicians, we may be more vulnerable to external influences altering our creative self-esteem. This would clearly affect then how confident we might feel actually investing time and resources in our music amidst external events such as COVID-19. So if we're more likely to be swayed in terms of how confident we feel about our creativity, for, for they're saying that for a lot of female students, It's not fixed, their creative identity, that female students one month could feel really confident creatively and then two months later could really be doubting just how creative they are. And therefore, external factors really play into that. So if we're living in a situation like now where there's lots of very pressing, difficult, uncertain issues, it could be that women are feeling um, much less creatively confident because obviously these are uncertain times but also that they might feel, well, this is very self-indulgent. So why should I invest my time in that as opposed to doing something really useful? Um, So that could be another reason why you're telling yourself these narratives if you are. So there's another question then. What value has music had in your hardest, darkest times? I think it's really important that we maybe take a step back and perhaps look outside of ourselves in order to get a bit of perspective on whether creativity and investing in your creativity right now is actually really valid and useful and important. So I'd like you to take a trip back memory lane with me. Think back to a time when you were really suffering, when you really were finding life difficult and you were finding it maybe even hard to cope. What got you through that time? And yes, it might have been the charity or the dedication of healthcare workers, for example. Um, I bet you a million pounds, though, that music and the arts in general played a really important role in your healing and your processing. I know personally, when I've been going through really difficult times, there are whole albums that are the soundtrack to that time. And if I just listen to those albums and those songs, it brings me right back there. And that they, you know, as well as certain close members of my family or friends or, um, you know, like I was saying, a a healthcare worker that was particularly compassionate, as well as those important people, it was those, those songs and that music that got me through that time. So why on earth would we think that us making music is pointless and valueless in comparison to being a frontline healthcare worker? I'm not trying to compare the two like for like. They are so different. But you must get my point. When we go back your memory lane and we think about the times you've been suffering, you know how important music has been. And you know just how intimately and how profoundly music can connect with somebody and help them get through to the next day. So I hope that just taking that perspective and taking that step back helps you to see that actually you making music could be a lifeline for somebody out there and you can't predict how or when or who. That's not in your power. But what is in your power is to try, is to make music and and to make music from a place of authenticity and empathy and being just human. And one example that I've got from my own past uh, repertoire is a song that I released called Little Sounds of Pain. A Little Sounds of Pain was written when I was going through a really tough time when I'd first developed tinnitus 
and I had very little clue of what to do about it. I was suicidal. I was really in one of my darkest places. And I wrote this song describing what it was like living with tinnitus. And once I was a little bit better, it was released on an album and I then dedicated a percentage of the sales of the album to the British Tinnitus Association and I struck up a relationship with them and they featured the song in their journal and they featured it on their blog and it meant that different people who had tinnitus listened to it and um, and then there started to be people that identified with it and listened to it online on places like YouTube and Spotify and SoundCloud and now even years after, I think it's been... Um, seven years since I released that song I still get people every single month messaging me and telling me that that is the only song they have come across the only thing they have come across that truly describes what living with tinnitus is like and for me to read those messages I have no doubt just how incredibly important it is to use your gift and your skills as a musician to not necessarily, you know, only write for other people, but to write from a place of authenticity and empathy and compassion and, and being a human and to, to share that because you just never know who it's going to help and how and when. And so for me, I, I definitely have seen this firsthand with my own music. I couldn't have predicted it. I didn't write the song hoping that this would happen. I wrote it because I had to get this out of me this experience in this very difficult time but now it's so fulfilling and so rewarding knowing that that song touches people all over the world and that I get messages from people like I said every month telling me that it's the only thing that has ever described what they're going through and that is incredible and any musician can do that you know that's not special to me and I know you felt that about other people's songs. So you don't know how or when or why your music could touch someone. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it anyway. It really might be the the incredible, connecting, intimate window into their soul. But it could also just be light relief. And God knows we're craving that right now. So even if that person is yourself, even if you need that, isn't that worth it in itself? It totally is. So please don't undermine the importance of you just expressing something to, to help you get through this time. That is important. And I really want to um, just flag up this idea of moving on from an either or to a both and attitude. It's really simple to think of life in either or terms. And that just means, you know, either I spend time on my music or I do something more important. And in fact, it's really a both and scenario. Music, like all creative energies, is a both and entity. So you don't have to either self-indulge in your music or do something worthy. You can both invest in your self-expression and contribute to something good in this world. And I think that my song Little Sounds of Pain is a really good example of that. But there's lots of other examples we could draw from from so many different musicians. You can both invest in your self-expression and contribute something good in this world. And that might be wholly through your music, but it could also be between two different callings. So it might be that you spend time on your music, but you also volunteer at a food bank or maybe you volunteer at a local, your local green party. There could be lots of different ways that you are helping in these difficult times, but also spending time on your music. And the last thing I want to flag up is the possibility that this could be an elaborate way to give in to your inner critic. Now, we can find lots of very complicated and intelligent ways subconsciously to trick ourselves into not getting started with our music, to not putting any energy into our music because we're scared. And we'll come up with all these reasons that we think are very worthy and very valid. And there's often a kernel of truth in them. But is this argument that it's too trivial to be focusing on music right now, considering everything that's going on in the world, is this just an elaborate way for you to not have to take that risk and make those bold moves and start taking yourself seriously as a woman in music? I really, really recommend that you think about that if you're struggling with this, because it really can come down to, is this another way to procrastinate? to not do the work, 
So please do the work, my friend. Look at this with bravery and courage and be really, really honest with yourself because sometimes these very worthy arguments can just be procrastination dressed up and self-doubt dressed up. So there we have it. Perhaps it's not surprising that 2020 has gotten us doubting the value of music and sharing our music amidst everything that's going on right now. But that doesn't mean that we should listen to that good old friend self-doubt. Don't keep your music hidden when we or you might need it to be out there in the world. It's not an either or choice. You can do both your music and good in this world at the same time. So please just think about those questions we've looked at today. I really hope it gives you some extra courage, some more confidence and some self-awareness to question what's really going on. Now, boy, do I have a treat for you in next week's episode because I'll be chatting with Julie McLarnan, who runs the fascinating Studio Analog Catalogue, where not one digital audio workstation can be found. Yep, that's right. Julie's studio, nestled in the Mourn Mountains of Northern Ireland, is 100% analogue and she'll be telling you why she loves working with this technology and much, much more. And remember, you can rate and review the podcast and that will really help us get in front of more women and girls. And if you want a little bit more inspiration for your recording and production, check out my quiz, Discover Your Female Producer Spirit Guide over at femalediymusician.com forward slash zero six. That's it for now. I will catch you in the next episode. Take care till then. Just one final thing, dear listener. I just wanted to ask what you thought of today's episode. Did you love it? Did it make you feel emotions and stuff? Did it give you a whole new philosophy on the meaning of life? No? Okay, well, fair enough. But if you liked it at all, just share a teeny weeny review wherever you're listening because, number one, my ego likes a massage and, more importantly, two, I can learn what you're loving and want more of. Oh, and three, it'll boost our ranking in the podcast algorithm, meaning more women and girls will hear all this girls twiddling knobs goodness. Triple win. I can't wait to read your review.